I love that we're here together as a new church family. And of course, that we've been in this new series called Chasing After More, uh, something that we got to start just last week. And it truly has been such a meaningful and rich conversation. Uh, we kind of talked about the idea how it is summertime and we're eager and excited for what awaits us. More time at the beach, Woo! more time out in the sun, Woo! hopefully less thunderstorms and rain like what we've been having. But we've been eager for more and we as a church don't just want to press pause or, or don't want to press uh, the, the cruise button and just coast through summer. We want to go deeper. We want to truly chase after more and have more of what God has in store for us. So last week, we, we began this journey of reading through the Beatitudes. and We, we talked about um, the very first Beatitude that Jesus mentions in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, which is, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Such a rich Oh, rich beatitude, and a beatitude, I mean, just the idea behind it, it's a, it's a, it's a single-sentence, kingdom-minded um, uh, statement of truth that has so much kind of, uh, that's packed within it, and last week was such an incredible conversation that we got to have uh, together. I loved last week, and, and this step forward again, and look at the next beatitude that Jesus shares um, in, in Matthew 5, 4, which simply just says this, it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I got to say, out of all of the Beatitudes, as I was looking ahead and, and just already planning for this adventure, this one kind of sticks out a little bit because it's, it's kind of the oddest, right? I mean, we think about being blessed, right? We think about this favor, right? This, this happiness that surrounds us when we, we feel so blessed, right? Everything is going great. Why on earth does Jesus say, blessed are those who are mourned, right? I mean, you never see anybody post a, a picture on Facebook or Instagram while they're at a funeral and they say, hashtag blessed life. No, that'd be, that'd be weird, Right? Nobody who's going through a struggle or going through something difficult would actually say, oh yeah, things are just awesome. Right? Nobody would, would ever talk this way. It's completely different to, to how, we even, how we live and how we interact with each other and how we display what's happening within us. Right? We don't like to share whenever we're, we're going through a struggle. We don't like to share whenever we have a problem that we're trying to, to jump over or face. Right? We, we don't like to share it. I remember it was about this time about nine years ago in the summer of 2010, when I first met Aaron. I, mean, I love telling you guys stories about Aaron, so I hope you're okay with that. But it was the summer of 2010 when we first met, and uh, we met through some mutual friends, and I got invited to go to the beach, and, and I had no idea if she was going to be there, and so we went there, and she was there, and I'm like, oh, who is that? Aaron? Okay. Oh, nice to meet you. Oh, cool, you know. Hey, I'm, I'm Andre, right? You know, like trying to play it cool. But I was like, oh, my word. Like she immediately caught my eye. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I've got to talk to this girl. So I remember the entire day as we were there at the beach having fun, swimming, playing volleyball, all that stuff. Right? We, we hung out, and, and it was just a blast. And I remember as the day came to a close, we, we all talked again, all of our friends. And we said, okay, hey, listen, we're all going to hang out again tomorrow, and it's going to be great. And I was like, yes, I get to see you again. Like, yeah, score, right? Can't wait to talk to her, right? Do some moves, right? Come on, how you doing? Yeah, all that stuff. But anyway, but no, so the next day we got to hang out, and I remember um, I woke up that morning to a, an awful surprise. An awful surprise. As I was so excited for the day to begin, I woke up to an awful surprise. You see, because the day before I had made such a horrible mistake, Something that every mom tells the, their son or their daughter to never, ever forget, right? They say it over and over again while you're at the beach. Moms, help me out. What is it that you guys tell your kids all the time to remember to wear when you're at the beach? Sunscreen, exactly. Well, that day, 15-year-old Andre decided, eh, I don't need sunscreen. And that next morning, I woke up, and I was red. Like, oh my word, even still to this day, that, it, it, that is the worst sunburn I've ever had in my entire life. Literally, like, we joke about, oh, hey, you're a lobster, all that stuff. But no, I, I was red. Like, oh my word, I could barely move. It had hurt so bad. Like, just flinching a little bit. It felt like the skin was being peeled off, all that gross, terrible stuff. But it was just awful. It was so painful. I've never had sunburn that bad. Oh my word, but... I was so determined to hang out there in that next day. So I got up, got ready, all that stuff. I put my shirt on, all those things. And, and I remember I went and hung out with my friends. And, and, and I just tried to play it off, right? I'm like, oh, I, don't, I don't want anyone to know. I don't want to 
seen like a, a wuss or anything like that. And so I remember as I, I came to see Aaron, and, and she looked at me, she was like, whoa, oh my goodness, Andre, like, are you okay? Like, look at you, you're so burnt. Are you, you're red, are you okay? And I remember I was like, what? I, I didn't even notice, right? Like, oh, that that's there? Oh, I just, yeah, I just am red all the time. No, yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm good, right? I'm fine, right? And then I, I go to pick up a soda. And take a drink. See, just fine. I'm okay. And I'm walking around like the whole day like this, right? I'm fine, Aaron, don't worry. And, and she's like, you know, there's some, you know, that aloe stuff in the bathroom. Oh, maybe I'll... I'll take just a drop, right? And I remember I go and I'm just like, like spraying it everywhere trying to, to take care of that terrible feeling. But the entire day, I just want to say, I'm fine. I'm good, right? Don't, don't look at me and, and what I got going on. Don't look at my problems. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Don't, don't see anything more than this. And friends, I, I believe that in some way, what Jesus is beginning to to invite us to see in this beatitude, this beautiful blessing, this favor from God that that means so much, is that he's speaking to our tendency within us to, to not really want to be vulnerable or to share what's really happening in our life. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I am when I say that for some reason, how we live life and interact with you know, another, we can all agree that, that we, for some reason, have to live with this status of always being fine. We're either fine or things exceptional. There's no anything beneath that bar. It seems like we always have to have life together. We seem like we always have to have things figured out. It seems like we can't ever really let people know that life is falling apart. We have this this feeling, this, this way that we live where we always just have to be fine and we have to tell people that we're fine, that nothing's wrong. It's like we're afraid of the discomfort and the awkwardness that, that, being, that comes with being transparent. And so we've, we've really kind of backed away and have ran away from being transparent and being honest with what's happening. And what's, what's honestly what's, what's going on in the midst of everything is that we aren't just living this way when it comes to each other. We're especially living this way when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. Where we think like we're fine. That we really don't feel like we gotta talk with God about everything bad that's happening and we don't think we have to lean on him too much or feel like we can't. Maybe for some reason in the past we've let people in our life and they've come back to hurt us and so we become very closed off. So we don't like to be transparent or vulnerable. We don't like to be honest about what's happening within us and and even so when it comes to our walk with God, we just want to keep this status of just being fine. Just being fine. When things start to feel out of balance, we, yeah, we go to church, we start reading our Bible, we start praying, but when, when things start to feel fine again, then we just go back to how everything was. We just, we seek out the status of being fine, and, and Jesus is inviting us to more. There's something so much more real, and what's beautiful about this, this, this single verse is that this word for mourning isn't just talking about a general sadness or a general mourning, uh, which is which is kind of nice in a sense we don't have to be like a bunch of Eeyores walking around being sad and gloomy all the time, right? Just to just get blessed, like, oh, hey, how you doing? I'm fine, right? Why are you acting that way? I'm just trying to get blessed, right? It's rather odd that God invites us to mourn that we'll receive his blessing and be comforted like he, he promises. And, and what's wonderful is that, that mourning, and what's wonderful and hard at the same time for us to, to understand is that this mourning isn't just for a general sense of, of losing, losing someone we love, but it's actually more in a sense of losing our deep connection with God. It's a very specific type of mourning. A very specific type of remorse that Jesus is talking about here in this moment. Where he says, blessed are those 
who mourn when they feel like they're disconnected, when, they're, when they feel like they're, they're no longer in touch or in sync with God, that will be comforted when we mourn over our, over our lost relationship or when we feel out of sync with, with Christ, when things kind of start to feel on the rocks or out of balance. Blessed are those who mourn and lean in, lean into that sadness, that longing, and that missing for more. See what's happening, what Jesus is inviting us to recognize in this sense is that, that we need so badly to mourn and grieve over the parts of our life that do not meet God's standard of how He wants us to live and what causes this pushback, causes this, this, this contentment with our sin. Well, we're fine. We're just fine with how we live. We're just fine with these attitudes. We're just fine with these behaviors and these habits, right? We've been making it for so long. We're just fine. I'll just go to church. I'll just pray before dinner. I'll read my Bible every now and then. I'm just going to be fine. I'm going to live how I'm live. I'm just going to be fine. And I'm not going to take a step further with God. But Jesus is inviting us to more to grieve over our sin. We often don't really talk about it that way. To grieve over our actions or our behaviors, the things that we've done that God doesn't want us to do. That he's honest, honestly not really proud of us for doing. We just kind of often sleep him under the rug. We just try to ignore him. What happens is we unintentionally kind of put up an arm and we just keep God at a distance. And we miss out. We miss out on something richer, more meaningful of how he wants us to live. You see, there's a story in the Bible of this, of this incredible man. He, he, he lived out actually this exact same thing where he was being used by God in marvelous and incredible, extraordinary ways. But then he did something and tried to ignore it. And he tried to ignore it, sweep it under the rug and never address it. He did not want to to mourn over it. He didn't. He just tried to be content with it. And he actually ended up losing so much more than he ever even imagined. You see this, this young man, his stories in, in First and Second Samuel, and, and he has a, a rather unusual story. We, we read about his life, and it's incredible to see how, how God kind of picks him out of his family uh, to, to one day be king over their nation of Israel, right? He, he was the youngest of seven brothers. He was the smallest. How he looked and how he, you know, uh, how his body looked, he did not look like somebody who should be king, but yet God said one day you'll be king over this nation. And, and he, he was crazy, right? And, and sure enough, even as time went on, this young man, he, he was a shepherd boy. He wasn't a warrior, but then God brought him out onto the battlefield and he took down a giant named Goliath. And this young man, he, he continued to be used by God in extraordinary ways, and all of a sudden he found himself where he's on the, 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 the run for his life as, as King Saul is chasing after him, trying to kill him because he's jealous and he wants the same blessing and favor that God has put in his life. And he's angry and so he's trying to kill him, but he's running away, running away. And even when he has moments where he's able to take revenge, he doesn't as God protects not only his life, but his heart. He shows him extraordinary favor. And then in 2 Samuel, we see this young man named David become king. And he's now known as King David. And God uses him over and over again to win, conquer kingdoms and nations. It's an incredible story how God uses him. It shows him extraordinary, extraordinary favor. But yet then things start to change a little bit as we step into 2 Samuel chapter 11 because as I turn the page into this new part of his, his life, we read that, that at this new tar start of the year, King David decided he did not want to go to war. So he stayed home, which is an extremely unusual thing for a king to do. Nobody does that. But he decided he wanted to stay home, so he allowed his armies to go out and fight and battle and do all their, their stuff while he stayed home and, and would rest. And one day as he was exploring around his palace, walking around and looking over the balcony, 
he looked over and, and saw this woman who was bathing and he didn't walk away. He didn't see it and say, oh my goodness, and, and walked away. He actually stood there and he stared. And he watched. And he sent one of his servants down to bring the woman up to his room and, and he slept with her because he had all this lust building up in his heart. And, and so after a month or so had gone by, David receives the news that that this woman was pregnant. And it wasn't from her husband because he was out at war. It was from him. And so with so much fear and anxiety filling his heart in that moment, he gives orders for his that, that woman's husband to be brought back home. His name was Uriah. And he, he comes back home and, and, and King David just tells him, listen, as you're here, rest, rest, drink, have a feast. Just relax and make sure that you sleep with your wife. He, he kind of nudges him in that way to kind of cover his tracks, cover uh, his mistake of what he had done, and he tried to sweep it under the rug. And so he, he gives these kind of these instructions. He pushes Uriah forward to do that, and Uriah refuses. As he says that, that now he, he doesn't want to, to enjoy the comforts of being back home while all of his brothers and all of his friends and his buddies are off at war fighting, and they're sleeping in tents and on the floor. He's not going to enjoy the comforts of home. He's going to sleep on the floor too, and he refused to sleep with his wife. And so Uriah gets sent out back to the field and then King David gives the, the, the orders to have Uriah put on the front lines of the battle so that he would be killed. And sure enough, he was. So the news came back home and that woman named Bathsheba, she cried and cried over the loss of her husband. And after time had gone on, David then brought her into his home. He, he married her as they were readily expecting another child. And at the very end of chapter 11, we see a rather unusual comment the Bible gives us as it says that what David had did displeased God. There are a lot of things that humanity does through the story of the Bible that displeases God, but we don't always read that disclaimer. And right there, it specifically comes out and says what David had did displeased God. And so Nathan, this prophet, he's a, a spokesman for God, comes to King David at the start of chapter 12. And we're going to read together what happens next in the story. So we're in 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's also going to be on the screen too for you to follow along. So starting in verse 1, let's go ahead and read together. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his, his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to meet him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. In verse 5, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and he had no pity. And right in the next verse, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Could you imagine hearing that? This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah, and I, if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why do you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. And as David is confronted with what he had done, 
He simply just says this in return in verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die, but because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord. The son born to you will die. David became content with his sin, which led him to being contempt with God. Contempt meaning that he was at odds with God. That as he was ignoring what he had done wrong, as he was trying to convince himself that everything was going to be fine, as he tried to sweep it under the rug and just ignore it, as he tried to keep it a secret, keep it hidden, for no one to know, God said, listen, you're allowing this to harbor up in your heart and you become contempt with me. We've been starting to, to be at odds with each other. Not that you necessarily chose to be at odds with me, but because you were refusing to mourn over yours and because you're refusing to recognize what you have done, you've now put yourself in this position where, where there's this friction and this discomfort between us, this disconnection, because you've become contempt with me. That is the, the fury in which God says all of this, that you become contempt with me, that because you've allowed yourself to, to, to ignore, ignore your, your sin, sin and you've chosen not to mourn or, over it, you become content with what you've been doing. You become content with how you're living. You're just trying to be fine and keep that status. But you've allowed yourself to be content against me, at odds with me, the God of this universe. Could you imagine how it would have felt in that moment to hear that? Then he hears that he's going to lose his son. Friends, for too long, we've been allowing ourselves to be content like King David. We've allowed ourselves to just say, it's fine, it's fine. The ways that we're, we're disobeying God, we're doing things that he doesn't want us to do, and we just say, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, and we don't recognize that it's spinning us around and making us an enemy of God. When we ignore it, when we don't want to recognize them, bring it out for what it is, that's what happens. And Jesus is inviting us to grieve over our sin and what we've done to become contempt against God. You see, for a lot of there are things that we're doing that we try to keep secret, even from our own spouse. There are things, these habits that we, we have that we try to keep in the shadows that we don't want anyone to know. Maybe it's, it's we're spending money or taking out credit card debt behind our spouse's back without them even knowing. Maybe it's, it's us trying to stir things up about people, trying to be the, the, the control monster behind the scenes of trying to spread rumors about people. And it's, 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 it's creating those lies, and that slander that's being shared. And maybe, maybe it's looking at inappropriately, in, in, sexually inappropriate material that we should not be looking at, whether it's on our phone or in TV shows or in movies that God doesn't want us to enjoy. Maybe we've allowed ourselves to be drinking on the side and we let it get the best of us. And we've been hiding. We don't want anyone to know. But maybe it's while we're at work or even in the garage when no one's around. We drink too much. Friends, there are so many things that we try to keep in the shadows that we're letting to stay in our lives that we shouldn't be letting stay there. And there are even things that we do out in the open that people in our life know about. And, and we just say, oh, that's who I am. Have you ever heard of someone who said, that's who I am. I'm just somebody who, who does this. That's just me, right? We've made this mistake of identifying with our wrong behavior. 
that we've been building our identity on top of all these things that God doesn't want us to be doing. And yet, we've taken our feelings or our emotions, whether it's something we feel like we were born with or something we picked up in life, and we, we just kind of, we take our identity and we take all of our hope and our ambitions and, and our purpose, and we just stack it on top of all that stuff. And then what we've done is we just kind of sprinkle a little bit of Jesus. He's not really the core of who we are. We just kind of want to have some of God's favor, so we sprinkle a little bit of Him in our life. He's not really the foundation of which we build every bit of who we are on top of, which is what God is inviting us to do, to build our identity on Him. Not on our lifestyle, not on our preferences, anything. Not Him. Friends, there are things that we've been allowing to, to sit too long in our life that God is inviting us to mourn over. To show remorse for. Understand that He's not wanting us to live and just be beating ourselves up all the time. What a horrible way that would be to live. To walk with our head down everywhere we go and just beating ourselves up. Just slapping ourselves in the wrist. Oh, I did this. Oh, I did this. I can't believe I did that. Oh, my word. And we, we do that. We live that way even unintentionally where we beat ourselves up over and over again for, for our sin. But God is inviting us here in this beatitude to not beat ourselves up, but simply to show remorse for our wrongdoing, the things that He doesn't want us to do. And I love how it says that blessed are those who mourn mourning being about their sin. It doesn't say, blessed are those who are perfect. Blessed are those who never do any wrong. Blessed are those who got everything right. It makes it possible, doesn't it? Just simply showing remorse and saying, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for these things that I allow to sit in my life that you don't want to be there things that we're ignorant about, how they'll affect our, our marriage relationship, how they'll affect our family and our kids especially, how they'll affect our friendships and our career, our workplace. Maybe we're ignoring all these things and maybe we're in a season of life where we're feeling the outcome of some of those decisions or maybe we're in a season of life where we're clueless to what's on the other side. Either way, through the story of Scripture, we see over and over again where God invites us to live a certain way and there's going to be an outcome that's going to happen. We're going to live a life where we're always chasing after this, this, this false satisfaction of wanting all of these things, but it's really not going to bring about a true sense of meaning inside of us. It's not going to fill us purely. So we'll live out our days maybe going to church but not really walking with Jesus. God is inviting us to live in such a way where we mourn over our wrongdoing, where we mourn and we grieve over what we do that causes this disconnection, that causes us to unknowingly, unknowingly hurt our Heavenly Father. Understand that God is hurt. God's hurt when we choose to disobey Him. Maybe we have this picture of God getting angry and vengeful, but he's hurt. I mean, imagine if you were to give a, a, you know, a friend of yours some advice of how they could do something, and they don't take your advice, and they end up getting hurt. Maybe it's advice in a relationship or advice in whatever, but getting hurt. And it's like your heart goes out for them. It's like, I, I, I told them what they could do to prevent that from happening in the same way, God is inviting us to live in such a way. And he, he gets hurt. He gets hurt when we choose not to live how he wants us to live. Because he wants us to be with him. I mean, that's ultimately the promise of this beatitude that, that we'll be comforted. That blessed are those who mourn when we, when we show remorse for our sin that we are comforted, that we don't carry the baggage of guilt, we don't carry the baggage of shame, we don't carry all this regret that's been piling on our shoulders where we actually experience 
experience a real, a real level of comfort where God relieves those things from us. All that pressure of trying to keep those habits that won't die hidden in the closets. God is able to, to relieve all of that pressure from us in this promise of the beatitude of, of experiencing this comfort of being with Him, having this intimacy with Him that we've never known before. That's so much more than just going to a service or, or listening to worship music on the, the car ride to work. It's so much more real and meaningful that it's through our remorse for our sin that we experience a real connection with our Father. Where we really step into a true and genuine relationship. Not where He's measuring us by our wrongdoing. No, but where we acknowledge that we're not perfect. That we're not all, all, all that in a bag of chips. That we got mistakes. That we've got things in the closets we don't want to talk about. That we've got things behind us that give us regret and put shame on our shoulders. But He wants us to recognize that we're not like you. I have my mistakes. And I have my sin. God is inviting us to be remorseful about our imperfection so that we would experience His supernatural type of comfort where we're relieved of those things and experience true intimacy with Him. Could you imagine that? Not where we're measuring ourselves up against other people. We're not measuring ourselves against our own idea of how we should be. But we're just walking through life with God. And as we're taking each step at a time, maybe we do something that God doesn't want us to do, but we're able to bring our hearts before Him and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry that I didn't listen. And we're able to be removed of that guilt and experience that closeness with Him. It would be incredible. Whether it's something that we do out in the open or even something that we think in our mind that causes us to ignore people or to hurt people. These views, these perceptions that we allow to sit in our minds that create an image of somebody who, who's of a different culture or of a different uh, community or neighborhood who doesn't look like us. It doesn't speak the same language as us. Even us allowing those things to sit in our minds, God invites us, He invites us to be remorseful for them, to recognize the depth of our sin and to bring it before Him so that He can change it. These things that we allow to sit in our heads that actually, that actually manipulate and control the actions and decisions we make, God wants us to express remorse that we can be led to experiencing true transformation. Understand that. That God doesn't want us to just be fine. That there's more that He's inviting us to. More of Him. More of how He wants us to live. He wants to use us more. He wants to be even more inside of us. We think of the, the excitement we get when we have just a sliver of His presence. Imagine if we had more. We get overwhelmed when we feel just an ounce of or a drop of His love, or of His purpose, or of His hope, or of His peace. Imagine if we had more. Imagine if we had more. Friends, God wants us to express our remorse so that we can truly live out this real change that He wants to do in our life. Understand. Understand that, friends, I'm right there with you. But even as your pastor, there's still a lot that God wants to do in me because there are things that I have that are not perfect as a husband. There are ways that I talk to Aaron that God does not want me to. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Right, guys? We'd be transparent. We gotta bring those things before God so that we can express remorse and be changed, be changed to be made a better husband, be changed to be a better dad a better role model for Mason and our future kids. To be a better friend. 
friends, we're all in that same boat of, of needing more of God's work in our life. And one of my favorite verses that, um, that is so rich that I, uh, I discovered a couple of years ago that God has truly been helping my soul when I find myself in an unbalanced place where God is calling me to show remorse for my, my actions. It's First John 1, 9 that simply says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Understand, friend. Understand that God is wanting to do a work inside of us more than just forgive us of our sin, more than just that we just pray a prayer and we get some insurance from hell. God is wanting to do something real and rich inside of us where he's wanting to change us and make us new. Make us to look more like him and how we should be. And that comes when we don't just say we're fine when we ignore our imperfections. If we just keep living how we are, sure, things will be fine, but they won't really be rich and deeper. Don't you want that? I know that I do. I mean, Jesus says in this, this promise where we'll be comforted, we'll feel even closer to God. And even in that First John 1, 9 verse of, of being purified, being changed from all of our unrighteousness, being changed from all the things within us that are not of God. For some things we picked up from our parents, things that are generational that we've inherited, that will take a while. There are things that we've allowed to take a deep hold within us that will take time. That doesn't mean that we should ignore them. That doesn't mean we should just sleep under the rug and just say, that's who I am. We should express remorse so it could be comforted and walk closer with God and know more of who He is and know more of who He's calling us to be. Wouldn't it be amazing? See, friends, did you know that about King David? While he is one of the only people in the entire Bible who has that disclaimer where he displeased God said about him, he's also the only man in the entire Bible who's described as the man who's after God's own heart. What an extraordinary thing to say about somebody. Imagine if God said that about you, that you are a man or a woman after his own heart. Wouldn't that be incredible? I don't think it's because he took on Goliath. I don't think it's because he kept a pure heart even though King Saul was trying to kill him. I don't think it was because he was brave and courageous and fighting all those battles and he never lost. I think it was because he chose to show remorse and no longer be content with his sin that God said that he is a man after my own heart something that was said about him after the incident with Uriah. Imagine if we chose to live this way, what God would say about us. Imagine what he would do within us. Imagine the legacy we leave behind. Imagine the, the change of direction on our family tree the things that of your dad or your mom or your grandparents that they they faced their entire life. Imagine if, if it didn't have to be that way with you or your kids. Imagine. Friends, let's begin to show remorse for our sin, not to walk around with guilt and shame, but let's express for express that we are sorry to our Heavenly Father for what we allow to sit in our hearts, what we, what we say when we get angry in traffic, or what we say to our, our spouse out of bitterness, or what we say to a coworker, what we allow to sit in our minds or in our hearts that governs our actions. So although we, won't, we aren't necessarily saying anything, we're doing something. Maybe that's ignoring somebody, or walking away from them, or glaring or looking down on them, whatever the case may be. May we express remorse so we can know more of who God is. Let's not chase after being fine. Friends, let's chase after more. Because I want that. I believe you do too. Will you pray with me?